we saw in the previous video that transformations was basically the multivariable idea of a function. As in you had some input domain and the transformation chunged away and, and took that input and spat it out an output that lived in an output codomain. And we saw one sort of class of transformations which we called matrix transformations. Those were the transformations of the form you took some vector and then you multiplied a matrix A to it. So those are matrix transformations. Now we're going to see a different category of transformations in this particular video called linear transformations. And before I get to it, I want to point out that in mathematics, anytime we define some new structure, we come along and figure out what are the basic operations I can do on that structure. So for example, we were introduced in this course to the idea of a vector. And a vector had two very important operations I could do on it. I could take two different vectors and I could add them together. That was vector addition. And I could take a vector and I could multiply it by a scalar and I could get scalar multiplication of a vector. So those were the two sort of operations that I was allowed to do on vectors. So now if I think about what a transformation should do, the, the idea of a transformation, it should respect the operations that I have allowed. It should respect the idea of vector addition. It should re respect the idea of scalar multiplication. So with that in mind, here's the definition of a linear transformation. So we begin with the idea that a linear transformation is just a transformation in its own right. And remember, a, a transformation came with it the idea of a domain, in this particular case it's going to be Rn, and a codomain of Rm. In the future, by the way, these might change, but for now they're going to be Rn and Rm. And then the only restriction that it being a transformation imposed was the familiar one that came with being a function, namely that, that every input, it, it goes out to just one particular output. It's not like the input comes and becomes multiple different things. If you have an input, it, it tells you what the one output is going to be. So that's the first thing. But, but now we can have the two different conditions that are going to respect the operations of linear algebra. And the first was scalar multiplication. I want it to play nicely with scalar multiplication. So here's how it works. If I take the transformation and I apply it not on a vector x, but a scalar multiple of that vector x, then what I get is, is whatever the transformation takes x to, I don't know, multiplied by that scalar c. So in other words, if you have some transformation that, that does things to x, if you, if you scale the x, you scale the transformation, you scale the output by the same amount. So if I multiply by the input by 2, I multiply the output by 2 as well. That's what I mean by playing nicely with respect to scalar multiplication. And then secondly, we have that the transformation, if I apply it to the sum of two different vectors, and remember vector addition was our other operation that we have on vectors, that this is going to be the sum of the transformation applied to the first vector and the transformation applied to the second vector as well. And our sort of fancy math way of saying this is that it respects scalar multiplication and vector addition. Alternatively, uh, if I was to take the transformation, and I didn't do just a vector addition and just a scalar multiplication, but I did some sort of messy combination of those. Like, for instance, I took a1 There's sort of a... There's actually a different and equivalent formulation Namely, I take the transformation of cx plus dy. And what I have in the center here is sort of a generic linear combination of two different vectors. It's the sum of them, but each of the two have been stretched as well. And by the second rule, I can break this up as a sum of two different things. cx plus the transformation on dy. So, so here I'm, I'm using rule 2. And then 
both of these individual things I can break up using rule one and say that this is just going to be c times tx plus d times t of y. And it, it turns out that this, this second property is actually if and only if. If I have that second property, I can do a sort of restriction, for example, taking d equal to zero to get me the first property of my definition. So you might see a linear transformation defined in either of these two ways. One where I break it up as the two fundamental properties and the other where I combine into a generic linear combination. Now, one way we can visualize what happens is let's see how a transformation might apply to a sum. So, for example, I'm going to imagine that I have a vector here that I'm going to refer to as u, and I'm going to imagine that I have a vector here, and I'm going to refer to that vector as v. Now, we've actually seen what the sum of two different vectors was before. If I add them up tip to tail, then what I'm going to get is this parallelogram, and it's this thing in the middle here that is going to be the vector u plus v. So the, the vector that goes to the opposing point in the parallelogram formed from the u and v, that is going to be our sum. So that was sort of our geometric way of thinking about what addition of vectors was going to be. So now what I want to do is I want to imagine that I can transform this particular vector or any vector on the plane by some linear transformation. Now, I'm going to imagine that my transformation is going to be rotation. And it's going to turn out that rotation actually is a linear transformation, which is a little bit interesting. But it's going to be a little bit interesting that rotation will be a linear transformation because it's going to play nice with vector addition. So here's what I mean. Suppose I take these vectors that I have, and then I just rotate them around this origin some amount. Notice that as I do this, a couple different things are happening. On the one side of things, my u and my v, that they're moving around, that both the u and v are rotating. But then, because the u and v are rotating, the entire parallelogram that the u and the v defines is going to rotate. And so the u plus v is going to rotate, and we get this really interesting picture that as I rotate it, everything moves around and the, the u plus v sort of rotates in the same way that the u and the v is going to do. So, what's the takeaway? Well, it's that rotation is a linear transformation. You might say, well, hold on, what about if I scale it? What if I stretch it? Well, okay, that's fine. I could go and I could multiply all my vectors by some scalar. They're going to look something like that. And then I can rotate them around just the same. So if I scale them by a constant first and then rotate it, it respects that as well. So indeed, what we have is that rotation is a linear transformation. And you might have the objection that rotation has something to do with circles, and circles aren't lines, and linear has the word line in it. But, but try not to get too bogged down in that, because what we're defining as a linear transformation here is one in which the sum of two things goes to the transformation of both of the individual things added up together. And indeed, rotation obeys that property.